Welcome to the First Church in Chestnut Hill and our Sunday service for December 6th, 2020. We are in the midst of updating our video equipment, so hopefully I will be recording in the coming weeks in our sanctuary. As that depends greatly upon my ability to adapt to new technology, your prayers and positive thoughts would be most welcome. Now for our psalm, followed by our scripture. From Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. Today's Bible reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. I love when our readings are from Isaiah, particularly during Advent. He is foretelling great things that are going to happen, and his prophecies seem particularly relevant in this season as the day of Jesus' birth approaches. Isaiah is the first of what are known as the prophetic books. This book was named for Isaiah ben Amoz, who lived during the latter half of the 8th century BCE. Traditionally, scholars and authors have attributed the first 39 chapters of Isaiah to Isaiah ben Amos. Chapters 40 through 55, from which we will hear today, are attributed to an anonymous prophet known as Second Isaiah. The words in today's reading were later immortalized, if I can use that expression, by George Frederick Handel, who used these passages as the basis for the Messiah. From now on, just in case you didn't know it, when you are listening to the Messiah, you will know exactly where Handel got his inspiration. I will try not to burst into song as I orate today's reading. The book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she served her term, that her penalty is paid, that is she, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out, a voice says, Cry out, and I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord comes with his might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. The reading ends here. Cheers. 
Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. The Sunday's text may be familiar to some. It is one of the scriptures relied upon in the crafting of Handel's Messiah. The oratorio relies upon the King James translation of the Bible, and I will be switching between versions in a comparison. King James is the more aesthetically pleasing, while my typical Sunday translation, the New Revised Standard Version, offers greater clarity for the modern reader. There are times when we look to the Bible for beauty and there are times when we look for guidance. If we're looking for both, we might have to work a little. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. This is a part for the tenor. Of course, my singing would be too low for that part. Otherwise, I would thrill you with my soaring voice and impeccable phrasing. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. Again, this portion of the scriptures is lovely in its rendering, but the message was somewhat garbled, and it was clipped to fit in with the musical work. Here is the full verse in the modern version. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. There is no warfare going on in this moment. The people of Judea have been soundly defeated, in fact decades before, and were scattered across Babylon. Their sins had been punished and their penalties were meted out. And now that the debt has been paid, the people will be offered comfort. The Messiah starts with the words of Isaiah, but that musical entry point is well into the text at chapter 40. Here, Isaiah begins to explain the coming of the people's deliverance and their deliverer. The word Messiah is actually never used by Isaiah, but the idea for the Messiah, the idea of an anointed Savior, truly begins with the words of Isaiah and his offering of comfort to the people. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The voice crying out in the wilderness from Isaiah is suggested by Christians to be John the Baptist, John, uh, Jesus' own cousin. He was an austere and holy man who lived in the wilderness, an area in the outskirts of Jericho. The Messiah will now shift into a distinctive soaring portion, one most memorable and I'm guessing one that is particularly challenging to sing. I wouldn't know. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. The text is repeated again and again, parsed in different ways. The foretold changes to the world are emphasized, the high is made low, the roughness upon the land smoothed away, that which is crooked is made straight. Comforting. But that 
offer of comfort is really just a short portion of Isaiah. Most of the book is not terribly comforting, anything but comforting. When you contrast translations, the lovely language of King James sometimes obscures that underlying meaning, at least in unfamiliar language. But with clarity in the modern translation, there may even be greater discomfort. The stern messages of the prophets become just as repetitive as that tenor singing over and over about how the crooked will be made straight and the rough place is plain. I was reading an advice column in the paper the other day, not a typical thing, but the person seeking advice was asking whether to cut off conversations with certain friends, certain friends with certain political leanings, different ones. The question arose over tension after the results of the November elections. The person was frustrated that some of those friends were clinging on to a candidate who was, in this person's opinion, morally deficient. The exact phrasing of the question was what interested me. Am I morally bound to stop talking to them? Morally bound? Am I morally bound to stop speaking with someone who has a different political outlook? One described as more selfish and much less tolerant. These questions get into observations about the differences between our current political factions, which I'll skip over because it's not really helpful in this setting. Instead, I will focus on the morality of remaining in conversation with someone with whom I disagree about issues, issues I find to be both fundamental and in many ways non-negotiable. This is by no means the first time Americans have lined up in opposing political matters. The American revolutionaries fought with the British loyalists, the North fought the South, Labor union activists fought industrialists. Civil rights advocates struggled against segregationists. There have been disputes, large and small, across the centuries over any number of subjects. And yet, here we are. Now, that's not to suggest that we've resolved those various underlying disputes, except with the loyalists who ended up exiled to Canada. There are often social flare-ups that are followed by smoldering ceasefires. Racism hasn't gone away. Tensions about labor rights and equality and capitalism still around. You do not see these fundamental matters being finalized because honestly, how would you do that? If only we knew. In practice, you don't. You don't resolve every social dispute perfectly or completely or finally. You might tighten up the range of disagreement and you, you call that a compromise. Well, there's an old saying that a uh, resolution that leaves no one completely happy is probably a good one. It's also worth noting that such compromises may be anything but comforting to the people who are at odds, even as they remain in an ongoing conversation, if not complete agreements. What would be comforting to say? That we, well, we've, re we've reconciled everything, let's just move on. That's not usually the case even if progress is being made. Conversely, does that mean no successful efforts have ever been made on any important issues? Well, no, of course not. About the economy, inequality, racism, it's not entirely true to say that nothing has been done because inter incremental progress exists, but it can be frustrating. But it's still progress, and it shows that people are still talking. Now think about our reading. The prophet Isaiah is called upon to comfort the people, and yet he's doing that after having spent the prior 39 chapters discomforting those same people. That's a tough ratio of negative to positive. Isaiah is offering comfort, but notice the different changes he's suggesting that are on the way. The rough places made plain, of course, but also the crooked made straight, the valleys exalted, the mountains and hills laid low. That's a landscape transformed. Everything is leveled. Everything is made straight. Everything is made plain. That is comforting for some people, probably those who are in the valley. But it's not necessarily so comforting for those who are up on the hilltops. When I was in Israel, up near the north in Nazareth, I noticed that some of the hills had settlements clustered on the top. Well, most of the valleys did not have much in the way of buildings. And I asked my guide, who was a Palestinian Christian, 
why that was the case. And he looked at me very strangely, as if I had asked the most basic, the most obvious thing in the world. He said, you can defend a hill. You can defend a hill. Meaning that in the 21st century, there remained a need to have fortified settlements to protect yourself from those who might be seeking to displace you from your land. In hindsight, it was silly of me to ask that question, a silly question in a harsh landscape amidst a very sad state of events. The underlying disputes in Israel are about politics and religion, about who owns the land, and interestingly, about who is right. Who is right and who is righteous. And how do you talk your way through any of that? And yet consider what the prophet Isaiah was describing as a new way forward in ancient Israel. He was stating that the differences between people in this burgeoning righteous society would be reduced, perhaps eliminated. This was about the high being made low as much as it was about the low being brought high. This message is presented as comforting, but it is a radical proposition. Isaiah was originally calling out arrogant rulers in the kingdom and selfish merchants, both of whom had fallen away from right practices. He was demanding a return to the righteous path for the people, but also a righteous way forward for the entire society. To Isaiah, at least, that was a message of comfort. But this was not simply a reminder that, oh, you should go to temple at the right times. It was not a message about being nice to each other. Being nice is a far cry from being right or just. Isaiah was offering a vision of a utopian way of being. Well, the term utopia is actually a nerdy pun. It was invented by Thomas More in his book by the same name. Utopia is a play on words, the Greek words for not and good, which we hear as you, utopia. The idea being that this perfect place is really no place at all, no place that has ever existed. And this was interesting because Thomas More was an ardent believer, a Catholic who nonetheless criticized many Catholic practices in this book. And the responses he offered to these practices, the ones he attributes to a wonderful, even a fictitious place, they're quite different than you might expect. You could get a divorce, for example. There was no private property, but there was slavery. And the book is obviously a form of satire, but even the conclusions he reaches in this fictitious world are arguably short of heaven on earth, certainly from the slave's perspective. Isaiah was calling for a return to right ways, but that statement implicitly makes a great and not entirely warranted assumption. It presumes that there was ever a time in history, the history of Israel at least, when the high were made low, where the crooked were made straight, and the rough places were in any way plain. Short of the Garden of Eden, when had that ever been the case? Both the book of Isaiah and Thomas More's book Utopia offer a way to imagine a new world, one yet to be. Such a description of a perfect world may not be intended as a prediction of what is to come, but possibly as an explanation of where we need to go. If we do these things, if we make all of that happen, or some of it, it will be a good and righteous place. A near utopia in reality and not just on the page. There is an idealized picture being offered. It's a roadmap to be used as a way of understanding the work that needs to be done. The comfort provided by Isaiah is in knowing that a better world is possible and that it is within our power to at least head in that direction. But how does any of that help to have a conversation with your friends and relatives across the political divide? It doesn't help if you're trying to get a quick and ready uh, set of agreements. It doesn't help if the goal is just to make everyone feel better. The election season has been difficult. It has been built up as a high-stakes, zero-sum game. Winners and losers. The home team is righteous and the visiting team is a bunch of villains. I don't mean to minimize the importance of the issues at all or the starkly different political pr perspectives that are being presented. But this was never going to be like the conclusion of a movie where the end flashed on the screen with a t you know, tidy conclusion. Even after all the feverish rhetoric and the electoral brinksmanship, 
we still have to live with one another. We have to face many challenges in the years to come. And how do we find comfort in all of that? The political conversations in this country have for some years been fraught and filled with sharp language. But that is as much about the attitude as it is about the underlying substance. There is blustering and there is hyperbole. But that's focusing on the fighting rather than focusing on what is being fought about. When Isaiah offered comfort to the people of Israel, he presented them with a vision for how the world would be if the people acted in certain ways. So how should we act? It has been said that the ends don't justify the means, and we could spend a year discussing that proposition. But one of the many reasons supporting that statement is that using any means to achieve even a worthwhile end will often render the end as meaningless. I want world peace, and I'm going to kill everyone who disagrees with me about it. I want to defend liberty with all my heart and will trample those very liberties in the process. I want to follow the teachings of Jesus and the prophets, but I will do so selectively. I'll do so sporadically. I will do so when, where, and how I might choose. There is no simple script for having a difficult conversation between people who disagree. There's no easy way to convince someone to change their mind about one issue or another. The critical work of being in ongoing dialogue is trying to paint a picture of the world we imagine we are making. Why are we exalting the valleys? Why do we need to lower the mountains and hills? Why do we want to make the rough places plain? And we will argue about how that will get done, but are we really arguing about whether it should be done? Ask your sister, ask your brother-in-law, your friend, your family member, ask them to paint the picture of the better world they are imagining. Maybe they plan to exalt the valleys, but let's just leave those mountains and hills. If we try to share these images, even if they're far away from each other, so far apart, even if they seem utopian, well beyond our present understanding, we're being asked to speak about our deepest hopes rather than yell about our current grievances. That is a hard but important step. It might feel easier to complain rather than figuring out how to fix things. The prophets were always redirecting the people towards righteousness. Why? Because that meant that they were looking to that beautiful, far-off possibility and imagining how it might come into being. Jesus was always pushing us, pushing us to love and to care for each other because that meant looking at someone not as an obstacle to be overcome, not as an enemy to be defeated, but as another person trying to reach a distant goal of a better world. Now that may sound really naive, but every ideal is in a sense naive. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist until people try to make that ideal into a reality, until people work toward a distant goal, until people share with one another the dream of going there and explaining how we might get there. The first step toward having better conversations with each other is not about being nice. It's not even about being civil. It's about explaining the destination we're seeking and seeing if anyone else is willing to go along with us for the ride. You may have different ideas about how to get there, which road to take, but if you can figure out whether you have that same goal, the conversation may still be difficult, but at least you've settled on a general direction in which to go. That is at least comforting. Amen.
like the voice of one that crieth in the desert far and near, bidding all men to repentance, since the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning cry, obey, now prepare for God away. Let the valleys rise to meet him, and the hills bow down to greet him. Make ye straight what long was crooked, make the rougher places plain. Let your hearts be true and humble, as befits his holy reign. For the glory of the Lord, now our earth is shed abroad, and the flesh shall see the token that his word is never broken. Amen. Amen. Let's end our time together in prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Our service is ended. May our service to God and to one another never truly end. Be safe, be well, and God bless you all. Amen.